This is Sammy Morris conducting an interview with James L. Mullins, Dean of Libraries, on October 31st, 2017, for the Purdue Libraries Oral History Program. Jim, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about myself. Well, we're really looking forward to knowing more about you than I could find in my internet research. So, um, if you could please just start with telling me a little bit about when and where you were born and who your parents were. Okay. Well, I was born um, in a rural area of Iowa outside of Des Moines, and my parents were farmers, and my uh, father was Kenneth Wiley Mullins, and my mother was... uh, Lorene Gift, Gift was her maiden name, Mullins, and I was the sixth of seven children, and um, second son, and then I had a younger brother. And my family, the age difference between my oldest sister and my youngest brother was 18 years. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I became an uncle when I was four years old. Um, Wow. So actually I was probably closer, I was much closer in age to my early my earliest nieces and nephews than I was to my older brothers and sisters but the one nice thing about being the youngest of a large family was that I tended to think of people 10 15 years older than me as my contemporaries because they were my brothers and sisters and uh, so I've always related well with people older than myself Um, and then my father died when I was nine he had uh, colon cancer, and I just turned nine. I was uh, had just he died in February of fifty nine, and my birthday was at the end of of uh, fifty eight. I turned nine, and uh, so my mother was then. We moved off of the farm into town, and my mother had to start figuring out how to do for all of us, and she uh, went out and started working outside mm-hmm. the home. And she had never done that before. What kind of work did she do? Well, she worked primarily in a dietary, um, in a hospital, mm-hmm. where she was making food and that type of thing, more or less in cooking, and uh, which is kind of ironic because she was a bad cook. <laughs> she could not cook. And uh, I don't probably, it was mitigated by enough other people participating in mm-hmm. de- de- developing how to cook. She was, uh, she was rather spoiled as a young woman. She came from a rather affluent farm family, so she never had to do any farm work. She never had to do any housework. Um, Everything was always done. And so when she got married, all of a sudden, where everything fell on her to be a housewife and a mother, Mm -hmm. she always never quite accepted it. Mm -hmm. So everything was done in a hurry um, because she wanted to get get done with it. But she really instilled in us a sense of working. I, my first memories always were that as soon as we could start walking, she had us out in the gardens working and pulling weeds, um, picking vegetables, whatever was necessary. She would allow us to play for a few hours a day, but most of the time we were we were expected to work. And one time, my brother and I were out in the my two brothers and I were out in the fields pulling weeds out of soybeans when I stepped on this huge um, hook that you would put down at the base of the reed, the weed to pull it to cut it off. Mm. And I stepped on it and ran it up into my foot. And the muscles and everything started coming out of my foot. And I was probably about five or six. And uh, maybe a little bit older, maybe seven. And so my older brother carried me back and put me in the car. And then told me I'd have to wait until we got until he and my younger brother got done with the cleaning the beans, as we said, before they could take me back to the house. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I remember sitting there trying to hold my foot together, and bleeding, and uh, and the car is going by and rocking the car with with it because uh, um, they were going by so quickly. And after my brothers got the beans cleaned, they took me home, and my brother, old brother, carried me into the house. And my mother said, well, we'll have to bury, bathe that in boric acid water. And so they just had me put my foot in the boric acid water. And then she wrapped it up and bandaged it. And um, then the next day, she said, well, you can't go back out into the fields um, with that big cut on the bottom of your foot. And I said, yeah, I, 
I know. I was really happy. <laughs> and uh, she said, so you can paint the porch floor. And so then I painted the porch floor and had to scrape it and paint the floor. Because oh she never, never tolerated us not working. Yeah. And uh, so then after, after, I don't know how long it was, but she took me to the doctor to check to make sure I wasn't getting tetanus. And, uh, and he said, you know, Lorraine, you're the best nurse I have. She wasn't a nurse, but she always knew how to take care of us, and she always made sure we had tetanus shots so oh, that we didn't cool. get lockjaw. I remember being terrified of getting lockjaw, mm -hmm. and uh, so anyway, that was kind of my life. And then um, we moved into town, which was just a farm town, and I um, it was a small town, Dallas Center, and it was a population of about 1,100, so there were 60 kids in my class. And I went through school with them. I went my kindergarten year through second at one school. Then in second grade, when we moved into town, I changed schools. And, um, and then I was with those same kids all the way through high school. And so even now, if I were to go back to my class reunion next year, which will be 50 years, I'm certain that many of them would still call me Jimmy. <laughs> um, because that's what I was. That's who I was when I was little. So it was a it was a K through twelve school for the whole community, mm -hmm. and you said it was Dallas Center. Mm -hmm. So was that the name of the high school? Well, at school? that time it was mm -hmm. Dallas Center, and then it combined with some other schools, and now it's Dallas Grimes Community School. Okay. And uh, but it's now just more or less a suburb of Des Moines. So when your mom started working, did how did that affect work at home? Did, did the children take care of each other, or? Well, first, my two sisters, two older sisters. Um, one sister was eight years older than me, and the other one was four years, five years older than me. And so when, we, when she first started working, they were there. Mm -hmm. But then they left high school, or graduated, and one sister went into Des Moines to work, and the other one went on to college at Iowa State. So John and I were left by ourselves. So we were early latchkey kids, and we lived right near the school. So my mother worked until she got home from work at 7 in the evening, and we got out of school probably at 3.30. So we would just come home. There was no latchkey because there was no door. We never locked the door. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just took care of ourselves until she got home. And um, she, um, my aunts and uncles lived in the same town, so... I think she always felt that if there was anything that was a real problem, um, she would know that they could take care of us. It's one of the reasons now why I never, never can be sick, um, because mom would not let us be sick, um, because she couldn't miss work. And, uh, and so we would get up in the morning, and if we didn't feel well, she would say, just go to school. If you're not feeling well by 3 o'clock, then you should come home. Well, school was over at 3.20, yeah. and uh, so I rarely ever miss school and uh, because she just knew that we shouldn't be there by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, so today that probably would not be acceptable, but in those days it was, it was done. Um, and uh, so, but she gave us a real sense of perseverance mm -hmm. and, and hard working. My father, on the other hand, was one of these people that never knew a stranger. Mm -hmm. He always, always had something to talk to people about and, and would enjoy spending more time talking than working, mm -hmm. which was probably the bane of my mother's existence. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, if he took us someplace like to church or to skating rink, we would be sitting in the dark or waiting by ourselves because he would forget. He would get so involved in talking to his friends that he would forget that he was supposed to pick us up. Oh my goodness. And, uh, and even to this day, I have a, a thing about being left or if somebody is not showing up on time, it, it causes me almost a panic mm -hmm. because it takes me right back to my childhood. Oh, that and, would be uh, scary as a kid. Yeah. Well... I know that probably there wasn't a lot of funding available, especially in a family your size after your dad passed away. What what were your options for college? Well, I was a good student, mm -hmm. and 
and I was determined I was going to go to college. My older brothers and sisters had all gone. Um, my aunts and uncles had gone to college. Even my two grandfathers had gone to college. And so even though we were a farm family, um, farm families in Iowa, many of them had good backgrounds, good mm-hmm. educational backgrounds. And Iowa has an extremely high regard for education. So out of my high school class, out of 60-some students, five of us have PhDs. One has a law degree from Harvard, and he was the editor of the Law Journal. Another 20 have master's degrees, and then at least half of the class had undergraduate degrees. And, and that's out of a farm community. And it was just always expected that we would do this. Um, so when I went, was going to college, I also, since my father died, we had uh, survivor's benefits through Social mm-hmm. Security. Mm-hmm. And I think about it now, and I think it was like $100 a month, something mm-hmm. like that, for the two of us. And so when I went to college, my mother committed that money to help support me to go to college. But I also had um, scholarships and um, an award from, I don't know, Rotary or somebody. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to college, um, pretty much I didn't have to borrow much money at all. Um, It was, once you had a B average in college, there was a state of Iowa scholarship that you automatically got, so you didn't pay tuition. Wow. And uh, so I didn't pay tuition. I didn't do well my first semester of my freshman year, and and so I lost the scholarship um, for one year until I got my average back up again, and then I did. But I went to college to major in pharmacy. Mm. Um, I knew at that time that it, in order to be successful, you needed to go into a scientific or, um, well, primarily science because it was coming out of the 50s and 60s during the Sputnik and space exploration. Mm-hmm. And so I knew that it was, I needed to go into the sciences. I did not particularly like science. I didn't like math, um, but I did all right in them. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, okay, I can do it. And I looked at all of the fields, and pharmacy seemed to be the one that I liked because it had people aspects to it, where I would be dealing with people in the store, and I would be managing a store. In those days, you would manage a store. And I uh, had two options. I could either go to Drake University in Des Moines or Iowa. Both of them had pharmacy programs. And Drake was too close. Um, it was I wanted to be further away from home. And my brother and my aunt had both gone to the University of Iowa, and they encouraged me to go. So that's where I decided to go. And so I went there as a freshman. (coughs) Excuse me. And ended up, pre-pharmacy was the most challenging undergraduate first-year program you could go into, even more so than pre-med, because you had to take physics, chemistry, and calculus all the first year. Wow. Pre-meds took it over two years, but pre-pharmacy you had to take it all one year. Mm-hmm. And I got into that, got into those courses, and in high school I'd gotten A's and all of these. And then I found out that there were people that really liked physics <laughs> and chemistry and math, and I didn't. <laughs> and uh, And I got in there, and I know I've told you this story, but I'll have to tell it for this, that my freshman year I was taking physics and I had a noted noted professor um, who was very well known and but it was a lecture of about 500 students and then you'd have lab and I um, and we had assigned seats and so every day you would go and the proctor would check to see if if all the seats were filled and if you were missing then he would miss you as noted you were absent and so I studied and studied and studied. And we had three tests that were going to be 60% of the grade and 40% was to come from lab. And I got my first test back and I got a 35 out of 100 on it. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't even flunking. That was a D. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was horrified. I'd never gotten a, such a low score in my life. Mm-hmm. And so I studied and studied and studied, got the second test back, and it was another 35. And I was just mortified. So I thought, well, I'm not going to do that again. I'll study and I'll be ready. 
um, when the time comes and I'll, I'll get a better grade. So I studied, took the test, and got it back, and I had a third 35, my same score. And I went up to the professor, and I said, I, I've never seen that. I, I used to be smart. I don't understand this. He said, who are you? <laughs> and Because he didn't have a clue who I was. So I told him, and he looked in his grade book, and he went, oh, you're the one that got the 335s in a row. He said, do you realize the odds against getting the same score on the test three times in a row? And I went, oh, yeah, I'm real proud. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you get a C in lab, I'll give you a C in the course. And I wasn't too sure I was going to get a C in lab. And he said, but you've got to promise me one thing. And then I said, what's that? And he said, you never take another physics class. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's not a problem. <laughs> and uh, in chemistry, I got a C in it as well, but it met my science requirement. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the next semester, I went into business for about mm, six weeks. And I went to several meetings, and all they ever talked about was making money. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like that. And so I ended up taking a, I was enrolled in a course of Old Testament survey being taught by um, a rabbi, an old rabbi, fascinating man, Frederick Bargaber. And I really consider him to be one of my earliest mentors because his life story was so inspiring. He was born in Germany, Jewish family. And after, during World War II or right before it, his family left. He would have been in his 30s, I think, because I think he was born in the early 20th century. And he went to Paris, and he fought in the underground in, in Paris with a lot of potential danger because, of course, being Jewish. And then after the war, he came to the United States and ended up getting a doctorate and, uh, and teaching at Iowa. And the, he made the Old Testament really ring true. It, it always mm -hmm. kind of bothered me that there were so many discordant stories in it. And so he helped me understand it. I also then ended up taking Hebrew and ended up majoring in religion. Mm -hmm. And then I added history. Then I added political science. So All I had a, majors? Mm -hmm, I, had triple, I had a triple major. I ended up graduating with honors. And I think I, I, think I had honors only in religion. Yeah, it mm -hmm. was just religion. And, uh, and so I, all the time I was in college, I was preparing to go on to graduate school. But I was going to go to graduate school at um, either Harvard, Yale, or Princeton. And so in the summer of 71, yeah, it would have been 71, I went with a friend of mine and we toured, um, started out at Princeton, went to Yale, and then to Harvard. And, uh, and so I applied to Princeton with support from the faculty at Iowa. Um, see, as an undergraduate, there were only three of us majoring in religion as undergrads. It was a graduate program. And so almost all of my courses were graduate courses. And so I, I applied, and this one professor was my sponsor. And I was accepted at Princeton, and I had a full scholarship, full ride. And, uh, and so I was going to do a, a doctorate in Old Testament Judaic theology. And... Uh, and I um, look back at it now. Oh, so then what happened was I um, was working in the library. I started working in the library as a freshman. My brother had told me, whatever you do, get a job in the library. He said, you'll be able to study and get paid at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I did. The first semester I was at Iowa, I went to see the librarian, circulation librarian, and he said, we only hire upperclassmen. We don't hire freshmen. And I said, really? And he said, yes, you're not reliable enough. Mm -hmm. And so every week I would go in and see him and try to get to convince him. Finally, at the end of the first semester, um, he agreed to put me on. But I had to take all the shifts that nobody else wanted. <laughs> and so I had sat Friday night from 10 to midnight Saturday morning from 7.30 until 10, Saturday afternoon from 1 to 4, and Saturday evening from 8 till midnight. 
and then again Sunday evening or afternoon, I can't remember which, but it was most of the weekend. Mm. And I had my grades all of a sudden just shot up because I was studying all the time. And uh, <coughs> and so that was my introduction to the library. And so for three years, I worked in the library, worked on the circulation desk, would see librarians, but always thought they were just a little odd <laughs> um, because they usually were either not very friendly. They most never spoke to the students. Mm -hmm. um, and they were kind of um, uptight. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought, I don't really want to be a librarian. But my senior year, after I'd been accepted at Princeton, my um, one of my friends had graduated a year before I started library school. And he would come down and talk to me at the, at the circulation desk about what he was studying. And I said, so you're actually being taught how to do something? And I said, you're not just being taught how to think? Because, you know, when you're studying history, religion, political science, pretty much all you're doing is learning theories, processes, um, information, processing information, but you're not being taught how to actually practice something. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, no. He said, I'm being taught how to catalog. I'm being taught how to find materials in the reference books. So I went up and talked with the director of the, of the um, library science program and decided to apply and was accepted. And how did I pay for it? Oh, I must have gotten a loan. I know I did. So this was at Iowa where you talked to the director of the library science program? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The library science program was only getting accredited that year. Mm -hmm. um, it had only been, it had been around for a while, but not long. Mm -hmm. And so the, I was there the first year it was actually accredited by the American Library Association. And then, so I, my family came out for commencement, my mother and aunts and sisters. And... I announced to them at commencement or after commencement at dinner that I wasn't going to Princeton in the fall, that I was staying at Iowa to work on my library degree, and they were overjoyed. Really? Oh, yeah. Um, my aunt was a librarian, and they were good, practical people who saw that if I got a library degree, I might get a job. Mm -hmm. They weren't too sure about this doctorate in religion. Mm -hmm. And looking back at it, I probably thought, no, I think I made the right decision because there were not going to be a lot of jobs for PhDs in religious um, um, studies. Mm -hmm. And so I stayed at Iowa for a year and went to library school. And it was, mm, it was an interesting experience because one of the things that we had to do in the bibliography of the humanities was we had to do, create an annotated bibliography um, using a foreign language. And so I had studied German, so I did it in German. Well, my honors thesis for religion was angelology and demonology in the Old Testament Judaic tradition. Mm. And I got an A on it and mm. did a decent job, I guess. And But when I started through the library school and was taking courses in bibliography, the humanities, and all this, I started finding all of these resources that I didn't know were available. Mm -hmm. And I... I thought, my God, my paper could have been a lot better. And I went back to my major, to the professor who, who was my major advisor on my honors thesis, and I said, Dr. Kuntz, why didn't you tell me about these things? And he said, well, I thought you'd find them. And I said, I didn't. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I swore at that time that if I ever was in the position where I could ensure that students would not have that same experience, I would do it. So I've been committed to information literacy, which we didn't call it at the time. It was bibliographic instruction or whatever, that I was going to be committed to ensure that students would not have that same experience, that they would have gone through a project and then later discovered they could have been, it could have been a lot better. I was going to ask you about that because that's been a theme throughout several of your positions where you've made it clear that um, libraries have a role to play in teaching students how to find information. So um, when you were, when you entered the library program at Iowa, were there, were they teaching about that kind of work mm -hmm. yet? No, um, not at all. No, it was, that was, I was talking to somebody recently about it, that when I entered library school, 
all the library schools had a curriculum that was almost exactly alike. There was almost no differentiation because everybody took cataloging, everybody took um, bibli bibliography of the humanities, social sciences, or sciences. Um, you took reference. You took reference one, reference two, advanced reference. Um, let's see, what else would we have had? Oh, sometimes maybe a technical services course or a government documents course. It was already very prescribed. Mm -hmm. and, and so anybody graduating from library school in the 70s when I did would have all had about the same instruction. And, and we would have all been going out and looking for pretty much the same jobs. Um, it was, we knew that we were going to be a cataloger, we were going to be a reference librarian, and even the differentiation between public and academic was not that mm -hmm. great. Um, because I remember taking a course in academic librarianship, but I think I also took it in public, I think, because mm -hmm. I actually interviewed for a public library job. Um, so it, it wasn't that unique. Um, it was very rote about what we learned. Now, the one thing at Iowa that was very unique was our advanced reference course. We had, we had a system where throughout the state of Indiana, or straight state of Iowa, um, the, libraries, the libraries in the state had, had uh, teletype machines. Now, who's ever seen a teletype machine? But people could type in their question and it would print out at the library school in Iowa. And, and then we would be given the question. Mm. And we could then have any of the resources to find the answer. And, and we even had a credit card where we could use that to call long distance to find any resource. Because the instructor said, you can find it from any reliable source as long as you cite it and you know that they're authoritative. And so one time I had a question about who sponsors the national plowing contest, which of course could be a question raised in Iowa. And I went to all of the typical reference sources, um, Encyclopedia of Associations, I don't know, Agricultural Index or whatever, could not find it. Mm -hmm. And I finally went to my professor and I said, I know one person that I can call who can tell me this. And he said, who's that? And I said, my uncle. My uncle is a county extension agent for Iowa State. And I said, he'll be able to tell me. He said, well, call him. So I called my uncle, and um, he said, well, I really can't, he said, I really don't know who sponsors the National Plowing Contest. And then he proceeded to tell me the history of the plow from the Middle Ages on. Um, that um, he, the one thing about farmers is that they become, they have a lot of time to do a lot of thinking. And so he must have gone into, must have been curious about the history of, far, of plows. So he got in and did, did a lot of reading and research on plows and, and said, really, that's what helped the whole um, creation of the economy in Europe. So anyway, he told me, I don't know who sponsored the National Plowing Contest, but last year's plowing contest was held at the farm of Vern Hansen in Montevideo, Minnesota. And you call Vern. I've got his number here. He said, you call Vern and you tell him you're Lauren Mullins' nephew mm -hmm. and you need this information. So I called this Vern Hansen up in Montevideo, Minnesota, and, and I got his wife and it was her lunchtime and I heard her yelling, it's Lauren Mullins' nephew, he needs to have some information. Mm -hmm. So the guy came over and, uh, and he came on and I asked him what I needed, or I told him what I needed and he said, well, that's the National Plowing Association located in... Um, Hmm. gosh, the town in Iowa. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I got all of the information I needed. And those were the kinds of things that today we would probably find on the Internet mm -hmm. without any trouble. Mm -hmm. But when you were in those days, you really felt like you were a sleuth to find the information that people needed. And, and people really appreciated the knowledge you had for being able to find that I particular bet. bit of information. And I remember another one came in where this man was a veteran of the war of 18, the Spanish American War in 1898, which meant he had to be really old. And he wanted to know the words to the song, Remember the Maine. Hmm. And, 
And so I found this book in the library, which was Songs of the Spanish-American War. But unfortunately, there were like 20 or 30 songs called Remember the Maine. So I had no oh. idea which one he uh -huh. wanted. <laughs> and uh, so I never know if he ever found the one he remembered or not. Probably at mm -hmm. that age, he, as long as he got a song that said Remember the Maine, he didn't care. You're right. <laughs> uh, but so anyway, when I graduated from library school, I was interested in academic libraries. Mm -hmm. And... But I did interview at a public library job, and it was the oddest experience I'd ever had because it was a public library in southern Minnesota, and they invited this other man and me to interview, and then they asked if we could just come up together, and I guess to save money. And so he had a car that was more serviceable than mine. But he also had a wife. And so the three of us headed on to Minnesota to interview. And his wife, more or less, was telling me all the way as we were driving down the road why her husband was qualified and I wasn't. Oh, wow. And I said, I know. I'm just going along to help him assess the job. I, I said, I, I know he's really the best qualified. Well, then the car broke down. Mm. And, uh, and this is long before cell phones. And so she, the guy got out of the car, and almost immediately he was picked up to be taken to the, we were on the interstate, taken to the next exit. So she and I were left in the car together. And all of a sudden she started saying, well, you know, maybe you do have a chance at the job. <laughs> and I don't know whether she felt that either I was going to attack her now that she was there by herself or that I was the only thing standing between her and some mad rapist who would stop along the road. But we got up to Minnesota and he and I both interviewed. The director of the library came over and said, you're actually the one they want, but you're not married. Mm. And he said, they don't want a single man in the library. And uh, and he said, so they're going to hire this other man because he has a wife. And I went, yeah, some wife. <laughs> um, and uh, and so they could be that obvious wow. in those days about what qualify what things would qualify you or not qualify you for uh -huh. the job. So anyway, I interviewed for two other jobs: one in Northern Kentucky, and then in Georgia Southern. And I. Um, was offered the job at Georgia Southern and took that. Um, and what position was that? Cataloger. Okay. As a catalog librarian. And that was in July of 73. And I had never been in the South before. Um, had traveled quite a bit, but never in the South. And that was just enough time after a lot of the civil rights issues in the 60s. So I went down there really kind of scared because mm -hmm. um, I wasn't quite sure what it was going to be like but I interviewed in April of 73 and April in Iowa it's still mm, pretty cold pretty miserable and I flew down to Georgia and all of a sudden it was spring it was mm -hmm. almost summer mm -hmm. and and I thought well, this is nice I remember thinking it was so exotic and but I flew from, I don't know, from Des Moines to Atlanta, and then from Atlanta to Statesboro. And this was in 73. And Statesboro was not a very big town, but it still had a, what they called an airport. But it was kind of like a trailer sitting in a field. Oh, wow. And the runway was a field. Mm -hmm. and, and then the pilot dropped me off, and he said, is somebody coming to pick you up? I went, I hope so. And then we saw this cloud of dust coming down the road. And there were these two women, the head of technical services and the head of cataloging, coming to pick me up. And uh, and when I got in their car and we started back into town, the head of technical services, Mrs. Brown, turned to me and said, we were so hoping you were black. And, uh, and I said, oh, well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> And she said, well, we're under court orders to integrate. And so we were hoping that you were going to be black. And, and I said, well, 
I'm coming from Iowa, and Iowa has a very small African American population. So I don't quite know why you would assume <laughs> that I might be black.、Mm -hmm. And she said, "Well, when I was in library school, she was from Alabama, but she went to library school at the University of Illinois, and she said we had one African American woman in my class, and she was from Des Moines." And I went, "I don't think that really holds very <laughs> much credibility." And、uh, I still got the job,、uh -huh. but they hired five of us new.、Um, Young librarians, and it was somewhat resented because they were also told to raise the quality of the faculty.、Mm -hmm. And so there was one guy from Texas, one guy from、uh, Florida State. I came from Iowa. Another man came from Columbia,、uh, from Columbia University, and then I can't remember. Oh, Oklahoma. And their idea was that they needed to get people from the Big Ten and from the other schools to、mm -hmm. improve the quality of the faculty. And I was in a faculty position. It was kind of resented by people who had degrees from North Carolina, Emory,、um, Georgia, thinking that they were not、uh, um, not qualified to be considered quality.、Mm -hmm. But it was an interesting place to work. Um, I had never worked in a place where there was so much、mm, eccentricity, and I I couldn't figure out at first whether it was eccentricity because it was a library, or eccentricity because it was a library in the South. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because some of the things that were unusual, I think, were unusual because it was in the South,、mm -hmm. because the people were kind of characters. Mm -hmm. And、uh, and so I don't know if I would have seen these same characters in Iowa.、Mm -hmm. um, and I had a person tell me one time, "You came from you come from a very conservative part of the country." And I said, "Not really." And I said, "We really have fairly liberal representatives in Congress and and the House." And they said, "Oh, we don't mean politics. We mean <laughs> manner of living." And、uh, and style of living, and and I said, "What do you mean?" And they said, "We enjoy life, and、uh, and our impression is that the Midwest is that you don't." Huh. And、uh, and I finally figured out. I was only there a year. What they meant, and what they meant was, they tended to look at life in a much more exciting and dynamic way. And and there was much more、mm, exaggeration、mm -hmm. in how they looked at things, and we tended to be very very close about.、Mm -hmm. I, I realize why the way I described it one time is in the Midwest everyone just wanted to be middle class, just absolutely middle class, and no one should have more money than somebody else.、Mm -hmm. In the South, that wasn't quite the same.、Mm -hmm. If you had any pretense to having money or a background, you showed it.、Mm -hmm. And、uh, and I can remember this one girl telling me that her mother said, "When you get married, you have to have your china, your silver, and your crystal, and all of your linens. You can be eating on a, an orange crate, but you have to have all of those things." <laughs> and、uh, and I thought, I wonder if that still holds true after all these years. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Well, it sounds like they were bringing people from all over the place, so there might have been something about the way they tried to bring in these different areas of expertise that caused kind of an eccentric environment too. Well, after a year, four of us left. Wow! wow. Because it was not an environment that we worked for a very odd director,、mm -hmm. and.、Uh, And the it, it was a big adjustment going from being in school to working, and I would go back down to the library in the evenings and work.、Mm -hmm. And one day I made some comment about being in the in the cataloging department cataloging that evening before, and the head of technical services said, "What are you doing down here in the evening?" And I said, "I'm working." And she said, "No, you can't. You can't be down here working in the evening." And I said, "Why not?" And she said. Because you're supposed to have that time off, and I said, "But I'm used to spending my evenings doing something."、Mm -hmm. 
and uh, and so it was it was having to break that that routine of thinking that in the evenings you should be studying or you should be doing something, mm-hmm. but not just going to work and coming home and not doing something. And so it was it was kind of also going back to what my mother instilled in us is that you should always always be busy. Yeah, and uh, so. Jumping back to my mother and being in college, I can remember, I don't know, maybe a couple months after I was in school, I went home for a weekend. And it must have been about 7 in the morning um, on a Saturday. And I heard my mother had been moving around downstairs. And then after a little while, she came upstairs and was knocking on my door. And she said, well, if you're going to stay in bed all day, you might as well stay at school. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, and it was probably seven ten or seven fifteen at that time, and uh, so you couldn't even stay in bed in the in the when in the weekends when you came home. Wow. <laughs> well, so it's it, it sounds like after around seventy four, then you you left Georgia Southern, and where did you do at that time? Well, I knew that I needed to get out um, because it was not the environment there was just I met wonderful wonderful people and some of them I still have contacts with um, but the library was very screwed up mm-hmm. and uh, so I went out and started looking and I think there's also a thing about when some people start going because there were two others who left before me mm-hmm. you start thinking what's wrong with me mm-hmm. and so then you start thinking about going as well so I wanted to come back to the Midwest. I realized that I was truly a Midwesterner. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I interviewed at Iowa State for a position in the serials department as a serials librarian and at Bloomington as the law librarian or as associate. In fact, I was was called the classifier. I was to classify the monograph collection in the KF schedule that had just been written by the the Law Library of Congress. Mm. And... And my interview at Bloomington was funny because I drove from Georgia up to Bloomington. And I think I did it in one day. And I was very tired. But I was being met that night for dinner by the head of the law library to take me out to dinner. And I got to the, to the hotel. And my room wasn't made up. When I went back to the room, it wasn't made up. And so they said, well, just go down to the bar. And, and you'll, you can have a free drink on us. I was only 22, 23. And uh, so I went down. It was happy hour. And I ordered a drink, and it was a double. They ended up bringing a double. And I, at that time, I was drinking bourbon. So I had these big shot of bourbon. I could barely get back to my room. <laughs> I was so drunk and tired. Mm-hmm. And got to my room, found out I had no toothpaste. And... Uh, so I actually was brushing my teeth with soap. And, uh, and I thought, oh, good, I'm going to start frothing at the mouth. <laughs> and met Miss Liebes, the law librarian, uh, for dinner. And, and they came around and they said, would you like a cocktail? And I went, oh, no, I think I've had enough. <laughs> and uh, and Miss Liebes said, oh, I'll have some tomato juice. Oh, yeah, I'll have some tomato juice. <laughs> and uh, so the... Um, got through the interview and the next day I interviewed I don't know who it was I can just remember her standing in the parking lot with me saying I, you'll be hearing from us shortly mm. and, uh, and then I interviewed at Iowa State and it was a disaster mm-hmm. and, and then I got the job at, at IU mm-hmm. and I um, so I started there I think in September of 75 mm-hmm. no 74 because yeah, I would have been at uh, Georgia Southern, 73 to 74, and then I went to Bloomington in 74. Um, and my job was to classify the library. And the librarians were very upset about it. Um, I can remember this one reference librarian saying, you're going to do us out of a job. And I said, why is that? And she said, well, right now, no one can find anything in the library. They always have to come to the librarian to ask where anything is. Because all of the monographs, the, the books, were arranged by main entry, by main author. Mm-hmm. And, and so none of the books were 
in subject order. They were all by author. So you had to go to the catalog, find the book. You could find the subject areas in the catalog, of course, but you couldn't just go to the shelves and see all the books in one area. And so she said, people are going to now be able to find things in the library without us. And I said, well, yeah, but we could be doing something <laughs> else. And, uh, and she was very irate. Mm-hmm. And uh, so my job was to classify. And it was the same time that we were also looking at OCLC mm-hmm. and integrating OCLC. And the law library was independent from the main library and had been very proud that it was independent. Um, but when I got there, I realized my cohorts, the people I needed to work with, were in the main library. Mm-hmm. And so I established a lot of relationships with them. And well, I'm sorry, were you the only librarian in the law library? No, no, there were oh, okay. public services librarians. And then there was Mr. Vidinsky, who was, he wasn't my boss. I reported directly to the um, head of the law library. But he was the acquisitions and selection librarian. Oh, I see. And uh, I guess he must have done some cataloging, too. He, he had a lot of languages. And then there were reference libraries, circulation and reference library, and uh, and then the law librarian. Uh, so there were about five of us, five law, five librarians. Um, and mine was a three-year appointment. Mm-hmm. I only had a, it was a term appointment that after three years I was guaranteed no job. I was not, I mean, I, I got the job done in two years, mm-hmm. and I thought, boy, this is really stupid. I mean, I just did myself out of a job. Uh-huh. But I had convinced everyone that I was useful. So they found me a regular appointment then. And I became the head of cataloging and acquisitions. Mm-hmm. And uh, But when we were integrating OCLC... Oh, so I need to tell you this one story. I had a, I, My office was in the bowels of the law library, in the basement... And, a, and bowels is really the way to describe it because I had this huge pipe that went down through my office and it was the main sewer pipe oh for goodness. the entire law school. Wow. And, and it went right down next to my desk and the um, and you'd be sitting there and all of a sudden you'd hear this No. And, uh, and people say, what is that? And I said, don't even ask. Oh, and wow. uh, so, I, uh, so I really worked in some holes. Um, <laughs> And so I, I, um, oh, so one day this one professor, Dr. Shornhorst, Professor Shornhorst, came down to my office and he said, I just want to tell you that I think your job is absolutely worthless. He said, there is nothing you are doing that is going to help us in this library. And I, I said, really? And he said, I, he was a professor of torts. And I said, I know where every book on torts is in this library. So what you're doing is only going to confuse me now. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, I hope not. I said, I, you know, I, I do understand how to classify and how to organize the library. And he said, well, I just think it's worthless. Mm-hmm. Sorry about that. Wow, that's quite a welcome. So this was when you were made the head of cataloging? Yeah, well, no, I was still classifying. Uh-huh. And... Uh, so then we, I continued classifying the collection, and we put everything back the way it had been on the shelves. And then over Christmas break one year, we shifted everything into classified order. Oh. And, uh, and then about, I don't know, two weeks after that, Mr. Shornhorst came down and apologized. Wow. And, and he said, I just want to tell you, I went to the stacks, saw the area where the torts are, and... There were books there that I didn't know we had. And he said, I just want to tell you, I'm sorry to question your professional knowledge. And he said, how did you know to do this? And I said, that's what I'm trained to do. Mm -hmm. Of course, I never told him that all the call numbers come from the Law Library of Congress. Uh So all I did was put those call numbers (laughs) in. And, And then one final story about this. When after we got done classifying the library, and putting everything in classified order, the public services librarians, the reference librarians, came to me and said, you've got to change some of these things back. And I said, why? And they said, you've put these parts of a series in different parts of the library. And it was something, I can't remember now what area of law, but there was federal, state, and international. 
and they all went to different places in the in the library. Mm -hmm. And they said, we have to use these things together. Oh. And I said, I don't care. That's where the <laughs> Library of Congress puts them. That's where they're going. <laughs> well, there was a point to where we wanted to start adding reference service in the evening and on the weekends. And after, the, after we convinced the law librarian that hiring somebody to work every night and the weekends really wasn't very likely mm -hmm. since they would never have a day off. And uh, so we all said, we will switch and we will take some of the evenings and some of the weekends mm -hmm. to cover. And, and I, will work, I will start working reference, um, even though I was the cataloger. I said, I'll start working reference. And the reference librarian started doing the revising in the catalog mm -hmm. so that they p picked up some of the things that I used to have to do and which I hated. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I only had to work on the reference desk a couple times before I realized how right they were that these, because I had to keep carrying these three things back Large and put volumes. them together yeah. in order to use them. And I went, this makes no sense. And so uh -huh. I reclassified them. And so I started realizing then what the Library of Congress says is the way you should do something isn't always the right way for that particular library. So we'll start there, stop there, <laughs> okay. and continue Thank later. Thank you, Joe.